In the woods of an earlier Ireland, and especially on limey soils such as we have here on the Eskers in the Midlands, yew was one of the trees held in the highest esteem. In the laws of Gaelic Ireland, it was one of the seven nobles of the wood, alongside oak and ash, holly and hazel, crabapple and pine. And this wonderful tree here at Tullinisk, outside Burr, is a distant descendant of the trees that grew in the great wood of Burr, which covered the eskers or down into the 19th century and still survive, albeit in somewhat attenuated form today. Judging by its frequent occurrence in place names, you must have been widespread in the woods of early Ireland. Here in Offaly, for instance, the memory of a once widely forested landscape in which yew was prominent is preserved in several townland names. For example, not far from here, we have Killinure, the wood of the yew. The two words for yew in Irish are yewer and yo. So we have Killinure, the wood of the townland. Uh, we have two Rathure townlands, Rathure, the ring fort of the yew. And indeed, the townland in which I live myself, uh, Clanahal, on the other side of Burr, is, I think, Clun Yochil, the meadow or pasture of the yew wood. When it reaches the age of 150 years or so, yew undergoes a remarkable transformation. The main stem stops growing. But instead, a circle of new stems arises from below to surround it, in time thickening to form arm-thick woody stems that coalesce with the stem at the centre and with each other, for all the world like the fluted columns you see in cathedrals. And indeed, some architectural historians think that the stone pillars of cathedrals are modelled on the yew trees of pre-Christian pagan groves. In very old trees, the centre may eventually die and rot away. And this perhaps helps us to understand how it is that in the Toynbo Cúilne, when Cúcullen is seeking true valour, he is told that he must go to see the great sorceress Scouta. And he will find her, we are told, in the vast and antique yew wherein she holds communion with her gods, wherein she doth instruct her own two sons. But this yew at Tullinisk, wonderful as it is, is a mere garsoon compared to the tree wherein Scouta holds communion with her gods. Because a truly venerable yew can be as much as 15 metres in circumference, even more. The Tullinisk yew is only four metres in circumference. The Tullinisk yew is a male tree because yew, unlike most trees, is dioecious, which means that it produces separate male and female flowers, but they grow on different trees. In most trees, for example, alder, which we looked at a couple of weeks ago, alder uh, is monoecious, meaning that although it also has separate male and female flowers, they grow on the same tree. So you is dioecious, and this is a male tree now in full flower, with hundreds of thousands of individual male flowers. These are the male flowers, hundreds of thousands of them, each flower consisting of a stalked cluster of six to 19 stamens, each of which is rather mushroom-like, a yellow shield-like scale like the cap of a mushroom on the underside of which are generally five sacs of dry pollen, the whole enclosed in an envelope of several chaffy scales. In wet weather, the edges of the shields dovetail together to keep the pollen dry, opening again in dry weather and scattering the pollen in great golden puffs when the breeze blows. And this is a female tree, also in full flower, but the flowers are absolutely minute. There are hundreds of thousands of individual female flowers on this, on this tree, each consisting 
of a single ovule enclosed in tightly overlapping yellowish scales. A single ovule, the gaping tip of which you can just see at the top of the flower. Notice that the only protection the ovule has is that wrapping of flimsy scales. It's not enclosed within a protective ovary. And this is the defining difference between the conifers and their relatives, of which U is one, the gymnosperms as they are called, the defining difference between them and the much more successful other group of flowering plants, the angiosperms, where the ovules are enclosed in a protective vessel, the ovary. The tip of the ovule looks just a little bit like the gaping mouth of a goldfish. And out of the mouth of this fish-like tip oozes a drop of mucilage, just at the time when clouds of pollen are being broadcast by male yew trees. Any passing pollen will be caught in this drop of mucilage, and as that dries, the pollen is drawn back inside the opening, where it can fertilise the egg lower down. We'll come back in the autumn to see what happens next. Yew timber was greatly prized in early Ireland for its hardness, its durability and for its colour. It was widely used for making high value small articles such as bowls and drinking vessels and so on. But one of its main uses was for making the planks for panelling the houses of the Gaelic aristocracy. There are several references, for example, to houses like this in the Toynbo Coolna. For example, this is a description of the house of the legendary Ulster King Croho Magnessa. Nine score feet and fifteen feet, its length from door to door, and it is built of fitted planks of rich red yew and roofed with planks of yew thatched o'er with lapping shingles. Inside the house, from fire hearth unto wall, there are nine imdas. Imdas were sleeping cubicles. There were nine imdas, and of these each pillar of bronze has thrice ten feet in height, and each partition is of rich red boards of yew. When the English antiquary Thomas Dinley visited Burr Castle in 1681, he tells us, that at that time all the furniture in the castle, the windows, the staircases, chairs and tables, benches, were all made of yew from the great wood of Burr, in which he tells us at that time there was much plenty of the tree. And he was taken in particular by the staircase, which he said was thought to be the fairest in Ireland. And today, 350 years after, it still is the fairest staircase in Ireland.